I am so pleased to have my guest Molly Sloter here with me today. I know Molly from music school and we go way back. Molly was my piano accompanist and I played the flute and I was a music major at Bradley University and Molly was amazing. She was an inspiration and she is the piano, she, she's retired now, but when I was in music school, she was my piano accompanist. She was a piano instructor as well as uh, taught many classes at Bradley University Music School. And the reason why I have her here on my podcast today is not because of all of that, even though that was just such an important part of my life. And she, I'm so glad that she's here with me. Um, but it's also about her inspiration to moms and how she really inspires every person that she meets and really helps you bring out your inner self. And also what we talked about in school was a lot about that fight or flight system, performance anxiety. And I think it's so applicable to moms, not just when we're doing a performance or giving a performance, but when we're yelling at our kids and we don't want to, when we're late or those type of things. So that's why I really wanted to have her here to talk with us today. So welcome, Molly. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Valerie. It's been a long time, but it feels like it was yesterday. <laughs> yes, it really is. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. What is that, like 20 years now? My goodness. Probably, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. But yeah, it really does feel like yesterday. And I remember like 20 years ago going into your office and I had this exam that I was freaking out about and I had such anxiety about it. I started nursing school and I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm so anxious. Like, I, I don't know if I'm going to, you know, get a good grade on this test. And it was just kind of you know, just talking, just talking about it. And you stopped me and said, Valerie, you worry too much. <laughs> and I was like, but yeah, I, I do. But <laughs> it's, oh, like, it's, so, it's so helpful when someone tells you that, right? Yeah. <laughs> it really did plant a seed in me. Because like, back then, I thought worry was a good thing. I mean, it really helped me. It motivated me. It made me study. It made me make sure I was double checking things, you know, maybe sometimes triple checking things. And it was just, I felt like when you told me that, I'm like, okay, well, let me look at this from a different way. Let me think about worry in a different light. And that was 20 years ago. So, I mean, it took me a long time to kind of get where I am today about thinking of worry. But, um, but yeah, it was just something that I really felt like was a, a seed that was planted back then. Well, first of all, can I please apologize to you? <laughs> because if I said something that directly judgmental, oh, uh, that might not have been the best. That's not the way I would approach it today. <laughs> no, it was great. <laughs> I needed to hear it that way. And, you, and, you know, I've been accused of being a worry ward. Uh -huh. and, and one of the things that I've learned in my lifetime is is to reframe that, to use a different word. Uh, instead of worrying, to be concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody mentioned that to me. I said, I worry so much because my husband traveled all the time. And, and he said, would it help to think, I mean, you know, you don't want to be worried, but you are concerned because you love him. And and so just to, to use that word instead of, because for me, worrying is like, pacing and breathing quickly and knitting my brow and and ugh. and that doesn't do any good it does not do any good so of course mm -hmm. i'm concerned for my husband or for my children but that's not the best place for me to be coming from to help and that's what i want isn't it i want to be helpful mm -hmm. but sometimes sometimes the way we approach things is not is not the best with others and with ourselves. And so that's where this, this business of letting go of worry began for me. And I'm still working at it. Um, you know, I, I thought when you asked me to do this, I jotted down some things. And I thought my main point wanted to be to talk about 
paying attention to my own needs while momming, mm -hmm. while doing the everyday tasks that are required to be a good mom. Mm -hmm. But when I get so focused on the needs of others that I don't take good care of myself, I'm not doing anybody any good. Absolutely. So Absolutely. that's where I'm coming from. I want to just talk about how, you know, I'm still learning. I mean, um, I'm 71 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a little bit about my history. I was married when I was 24. Uh, didn't want to have kids at that time. It was the 70s. Um, got divorced. Was on my own for seven years went through some counseling, was very helpful, and I started to learn how I focused on others more than myself. So I got a little healthier. Well, then I met a great guy. I got married. I had two wonderful girls. I have two wonderful girls, and I forgot everything about taking care of me. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so if I can be encouraging to younger moms to to – continue to give attention to your own needs, physical, mental, and emotional, you'll be the best mom you can be. You know, it's like when you're on an airplane and they do the safety stuff. What do they tell you about the oxygen mask? They say, put the mask on yourself before you try to help those around you. Absolutely. That, Absolutely. That, that's pretty basic procedure. Mm -hmm. But but mm -hmm. we forget that in in the you know the stress and the the pace of yeah life. it really and is it, and that's a dangerous place to be so. yeah yeah it really is like you're saying like you have to have your cup you have to fill up your cup you know in order to give to others and right. that's so important as moms I mean. I know I've used the example before too of when I'm when I was driving in the car and there was a bee in the car. I just could not focus on anything other than that bee buzzing around and all I could do was I just wanted to pull the car over as opposed to, you know, just focus on driving. I was I was kind of focusing on the wrong. I was focusing about, you know, my amygdala was firing. I was having like that frustration highway going, not frustration with the bee, but it was more like just there's something going on. But I feel like that's so applicable in our lives. We're always kind of focusing on what is what is in the present moment of the concern as opposed to what's going on around us and how can we smile more? How can we be present more? You know, because yeah. our children really do show us the present. And I learn so much from my kids and <laughs> more so I feel like than I teach them sometimes. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so one of the things I, I did want to touch on, and maybe this is the appropriate time to do it is, um, Awareness, awareness of your surroundings, of what your body's telling you. Um, and the way this applied, well, and, and the other term is what my teacher called inclusive awareness. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, when we're playing a concert and we're in the midst of this thing that we've worked hard to prepare and somebody has a, a baby in the audience and the baby starts to cry. Well, if I'm so focused on what I'm doing that I try to block out the other things happening in the room, then that sound is going to be a distraction and it's going to pull me away. Mm -hmm. But if, if I can continue to be aware of everything going on around me while I'm involved in this activity, then it doesn't pull me away. It doesn't jolt me. And I, I can notice that. And then I can let it go while I'm still doing my thing. For example, yeah. just a couple of minutes ago while we were talking, my daughter walked in the front door. Mm -hmm. and, my, and my tendency would have been to go, oh, hi, honey. What do you do? Well, there's not time for that. Well, she walked around and picked something up and then she left. 
Mm -hmm. And it didn't distract me from, so I'm aware that that happened, but it didn't distract me from the task at hand, which is our conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, That's a very good point. So if, if we can learn to, to always be aware of ourselves in whatever activity we're involved in, we're going to, everything's going to be better. Whether, whether I'm playing the piano or fixing dinner or <clears throat> what was my other thought? Um, oh, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, I'm not going to stress about that. That thought yeah. came and left and I'm not going to worry about that. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that makes perfect sense. And I think that our audience can, we all can relate to that, right? It gets it. There's so much always going on and I feel like just, you know, with three kids in my house or constantly, constantly doing something, but how do I just kind of go moment to moment and well, have awareness I just, of myself? I, I just realized what the third thing was I was going to mention is in conversations, mm -hmm. if I go to visit my mother-in-law, mm -hmm. if I get so focused on trying to please her that I forget to take care of myself, then I'm not as open. I'm not as comfortable and then she's not going to be as open or as comfortable. Yeah. So I can, the way I am with me affects everything and everyone around me. Mm -hmm. That's so true. The energy that we give off, you know, that's right. Mm -hmm. So can I, can I talk a little bit about body mapping? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to tell our audience about that. I remember Molly had, yeah, she had a skeleton in her office, and I remember that to this day. It was always there, and Molly has a lot of information about body mapping that I think is important for us to hear as moms as well. So go ahead, Molly. Okay, so I'm licensed to teach this approach, this physical, well, body-mind approach called body mapping. Our body maps are our internal representations of how our bodies are put together and how they work, how they function. So you can, they're images that are stored along that, in that ridge between on the top of the brain. Mm -hmm. And, and whatever the map or the picture is, however we think our bodies work is how we will use them. So, for example, I had a violin student one time who had pain in her wrist. And so I gave her a piece of paper that had a, a blank outline of a hand. And I asked her to write in, sketch in how she thought of the bones of her hand. She said, well, I don't know. I said, well, whatever you think. There's no right or wrong. It's just whatever you think. And she sketched in like a blocky thing with five sticks coming off of it. Okay. And I thought, oh, wow, no wonder she has pain in her wrist. She's not aware of <clears throat> the eight bones in the wrist joints, all mm -hmm. of those joints, that the finger bones start way back here, not at the knuckles, and the kind of flexibility well, now mm -hmm. we're talking to this, this podcast is for moms. So most of us remember the first time our babies noticed their hands. Yeah. And that's what, and that's what this girl looked like. She could, because we looked at the skeleton, we looked at an anatomy book and she felt around for the, those to realize that the wrist goes between the end of the arm bones and the beginning of the finger bones. This whole area is wrist. And so if we allow it to, to move the way it was designed, then we have greater flexibility and fluidity. Mm -hmm. So she picked up her violin and started to play. And the motion of her arm was so different, she started to get all teared up. <clears throat> she said, why didn't anybody ever tell me this? I said, because they didn't know. That's mm -hmm. not the way they were taught. My goal is to work with music educators to help them help their students be aware of these things the first time they pick up the flute so you don't get yourself into some weird configuration 
-hmm. whether, whether it's the flute or the piano or unloading the dishwasher mm -hmm. or folding socks or getting three lunches ready when they're all in grade school. Absolutely. So, so when I taught That's the class, we began with the spine. And we'll see see if there's, oh, yeah, that's going to work. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so this is the first sheet that I would give my students. And I would ask them, okay. I'd say, what's your map of your spine? And they'd go, I don't know. And I'd say, okay, well, whatever, just whatever you think. And people would, some people would, would draw a straight line for like from the neck to the waist. Okay. Uh-huh. Some people would draw a line that, that followed the contour of the back of the back. Mm-hmm. But most of the time they'd stop here and they had no idea what was going on with their tailbone, which okay. is part of the spine. So the next sheet I would give them was this one, which is that same image with the bones in. And you can see that I've outlined more heavily the spine. Yeah. The structure of the spine. So what we can then understand is that the top of the spine is not back here. It's not back here. It's certainly not there. There are seven more vertebrae above that bump. Mm -hmm. But that it comes up into the middle. You see, we're equidistant from the back of the skull to the front of the skull, to the front of our face. So yeah. it's another way that I explain. So, so you know that joints are named for the two bones that come together to articulate. Mm -hmm. And here's my spine. That's awesome. <laughs> so, so here's the top of the spine. The top vertebra is called the atlas. Okay. And, and this, of course, is a cutaway of the skull. This is the back of it, which is the occipital bone. Mm -hmm. So this is called the atlanto-occipital joint. Mm -hmm. And you can't put your finger on it, but I can tell you, most people know that hangy down thing in the back of your throat, the uvula. Uh-huh. <laughs> It is immediately behind the uvula. So it's that makes right, sense. So it's right there in the middle of your throat, in the middle of your neck, equidistant from front to back of skull. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people, people who think their skull is attached back here tend to stand that way. Okay. But if we know that it's in the middle... All hmm. of a sudden, all those muscles release, and I have better balance. Yeah, like you loosen up a little bit more. You loosen like, up a ton. Because yeah. The thing, the thing is, whatever the condition of tension or release at that joint affects the whole rest of the spine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we release the tension in the neck, and you can, I mean, we're good at this, aren't all of us? We can tense up. If yeah. I'm at the computer for too long or the piano for too long, I get like this. Mm -hmm. But I can pay like a attention hunch over. and uh -huh. know that I'm not just hunched by pulling down in my abs, but I've also shortened these neck muscles. Now, if I just let these neck muscles be longer, well, now I'm looking down uh -huh. because I'm still tight in my abs. But if I let my abs loosen, yeah, then I come into this kind of balance, and my and my voice sounds better. I mean, listen to the difference between my voice here. I when promise you're I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. doing anything differently. Mm -hmm. But as I as I release my abs and my neck, mm -hmm. then everything comes into balance. My throat loosens. I can take an easier breath. Mm -hmm. The pitch lowers, which is a useful thing when you're upset with your kids. There you go. And my mom, my mom didn't yell. She would just speak like this. Oh. She would get very quiet and she would articulate very clearly. 
and by God, we knew we better be paying attention or else, and I don't even know, or else what? She never did anything terrible. Sure. But we didn't even want to go there because, <laughs> we, because we knew she had, had reached her limit. Yeah. So the behavior needed to change. Yeah. That's very interesting. And for our listeners that don't see the video, um, I'm going to have this on YouTube. So I encourage you to check out the YouTube of the visual. Um, but it's it, it makes such sense like when you see that. And essentially, um, when you had said the uvula, like what's in the back of your mouth, like when you say, ah, that little thing that shakes, that it's yeah. right back there. And when you visualize that, I mean, I really do like expand. And it's again, like I, I talk about this in other episodes, just that that pride stance of expanding as opposed to contracting. It's all kind oh. of like, I feel more confident. I feel more secure. And I'm not as like a clam, you know? Absolutely. That, and, mm-hmm. and if we're talking fight or flight, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's a protective thing to protect that part of our neck, of yeah. the base of our, our spine. But we don't want to go through life being in startle mode. Mm-hmm. absolutely mm-hmm. so, yeah so yeah so that the understanding of how my spine worked helped me to release neck muscles which released my trapezius which then helped my arms to move more in a more fluid way mm-hmm. and my and my technique at the piano improved and yeah. the, teach, the teachers, the, the dear faculty members who poo-pooed what I was doing, and you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> At first, they did not want their students talking to me about this. Mm-hmm. But after they could see the change in my playing, by the end of it, they were encouraging their students to come talk to me. If somebody had, you know, a, a clarinet player had a problem with their thumb that supports the whole instrument. They'd say, well, maybe you should go talk to Molly about that. Yeah. And yeah. it was just, it was lovely to see them encourage their students to use this information as a resource. Absolutely. And, and it really, get, and not get caught up in that. I knew something that they didn't. Sure. Which sure. Was, was what made them uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. And we're all learning. We, we really all are. And I think that's, in every aspect of life. I mean, that we can really incorporate that. It's so... I couldn't agree more. One of the things Mm -hmm. I wrote down here was, I don't have the answers. Mm -hmm. I do know that I want to continue to learn about myself. And I, at 71, I want to continue to learn, to move in the direction of becoming the best person I can be. It's beautiful. My, my daughters are 31 and well, no, sorry, 32. And my younger daughter is going to be 29 tomorrow. So if you do the math, you can, you, you find that I was 38 when I had Dana and I was 42 when I had Maggie. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I was ahead of the game because I was older and Mm -hmm. new stuff. But I slipped into those the stereotype of being the perfect mom, yes, and wanting to wanting to take care of them and and not not let them be upset or hurt by anything. Mm-hmm. Um, a friend of mine, when Dana was born, said, "You know, Molly, you're gonna be you're gonna make some mistakes." And I said, "Oh no!" Oh, I mean, I I heard <laughs> her, but I said, "No, I'm gonna be the most perfect mom ever." She said, "Oh, we all want that." She said, but you will make mistakes. And the best you can hope for is that you live long enough to be able to apologize to them. Yeah. Yeah. And my girls and I have, I have had occasion to say, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I always tried to make you see on the bright, look on the bright side. I didn't let you be sad or mad. Hmm. I was always like, oh, it's okay. Look at it this way. Yeah. And I didn't allow them to own their own feelings. Yeah. You know, I've heard before that, like, you you may not make the same mistakes as your mother did, but you're going to make other mistakes. Like, there's always something. And, you know, it reminds me 
uh, well, it reminds me of a couple things. Uh, one thing is just what made me start all of this was that illusion of perfection yeah. and how I, I studied for motherhood. Like it was an exam, like same, like I'm like, I am going to be perfect. I'm going to own this. And then as soon as my baby was born, she was taken away to the NICU and my control just it's like, your, uh, your illusion of control. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> an illusion of control. And over the years, I realized that I am far from perfect. I'm an imperfect mother, but I'm an imperfect mother who loves. You know, And I say that so much because it is so important because we are going to make mistakes. It reminds me, my other point was... Um, Molly, when we were, I remember my senior recital, we what we practiced that for at least a year. Like yes. I yeah. was in the practice room three hours a day at minimum. Yeah. And the day of the recital, I taped my music too too tightly together. I was too prepared. I was like, oh, this needs to be perfect. And let me make sure it's taped well enough. And I accidentally taped a few pages together. So when I was performing, I could not untape it. So it was, you did a wonderful job just like, okay, let's just, let's just roll with it. And I was so like, oh my gosh, this isn't perfect now. But I kind of just rolled with it as well. Cause I saw you doing that and no one noticed. It was just like this. Okay. It's okay not to be perfect. And it's, it, it is like, no one is no it, life is not perfect. Like you know, if you look around everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So um, can I talk about breathing for just a moment? Absolutely. Um, I, I also brought this guy who is broken. He only has one arm and one leg and the legs backwards. <laughs> but the reason, the reason I wanted to show this is because it shows the, the rib, the ribs. Mm -hmm. So in years past, I would have said the rib cage, but Dana said one time when she was little, she said, well, if ribs move, why do they call it a cage? Oh, I said, what a, a good great point. question. <laughs> so what the model doesn't show is that the ribs are attached to the breastbone and sternum by cartilage. Mm -hmm. And we know from our ears and our nose that cartilage is flexible. Bone is not. In the back, ribs are attached to the spine by joints, mm -hmm. just like any other joint. So when we inhale that, that elusive organ called the organ, no, muscle, mm -hmm. called the diaphragm, is up underneath here. It attaches along the ribs and then is dome-shaped up inside there. Mm -hmm. There's another picture I want to show that comes out of what every musician needs to know about the body. Mm -hmm. And many of us have seen the image. Yeah, yeah, images like this. Here's the torso, and there's this line, and the mm -hmm. word above it is diaphragm. Well, I think I thought the diaphragm was a strip of a muscle. Uh -huh. But when I but when I looked at at this image, my mind was blown because it showed me from the side and from the front the three dimensionality. Yeah, it's very big. Diaphragm. It's very mm -hmm. big and it's very strong. If you've ever had hiccups, you know how strong yeah. that the spasm in the diaphragm is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just so, above the umbilicus for, or not umbilicus, never mind, I'm going to talk in my nursing terms, but the belly button. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. But it attaches up here in front and it's a little lower in the back. Mm -hmm. But then, but then if I, if we're talking about um, mapping our lungs, mm -hmm. I have another sheet here and this is what I do with classes. I will hold up this, I, they have this sheet, and you can see an empty torso from front and side. Mm -hmm. And I ask them to sketch in their lungs. Okay. Well, you get people drawing their lungs down in the abdomen. You, sometimes they make them really small. If, if side to side, they'll put them like in the front half of the torso. But here is the truth sheet. 
Uh huh. So, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. So they're rather high in the torso. And also, they go from front all the way to the back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They take so, up a lot of space. They three do. dimensionally. And yes, three exactly. Mm-hmm. Not just two dimensionally, but three dimensionally. Mm-hmm. And those ribs, remember, the movement of the ribs is flexible. So when we inhale, the diaphragm goes down and the ribs move up and out. So mm-hmm. that so that the lung cavity is increasing. It's expanding. I, that's the best word. Yeah. Absolutely. So you had asked me when we first talked to to talk maybe about how this applies to performance anxiety. Mm-hmm. And and I would say this can apply to any type of anxiety. Yeah. I don't have performance anxiety anymore, but I have anxiety over life. Yes, don't we all? <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure we all do. Yeah, yeah. And, and I know that because my stomach gets upset. I have butterflies. I can't get a full breath. My heart is pounding. My palms are sweaty. Mm-hmm. But what I've learned is if I can visualize the easy movement of the diaphragm, the easy expression of the ribs. And if I cannot take deep breaths, but take slower breaths, then I can avoid clutching. I can focus on suspending at the top of my inhalation before it turns into exhalation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in slowing down the breathing, I get more oxygen, my heart slows down, my muscles get warmer, so I stop getting clammy hands. Mm-hmm. And and if if we've ever been, well, you know, just think about being so irritated with the kids that you're yelling at them. Isn't, isn't that fight or flight? Oh, yeah. It's the, same, it's the same physical reaction. Mm-hmm. But, but we can, we can acknowledge that and honor it, but not let ourselves get physically out of control. Yes. Yes. Like riding the emotional waves of right, right. fight or flight. Right. Going with the emotion. Yep. But... I don't want to say staying in control. It's not about sure. control. It's about flexibility. Yeah. And rolling with the punches and just doing the next right thing. That's, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's very, yeah. And it really is, I, you know, and I think about when I'm really in that fight or flight, that tensing, like your, your breathing's increasing, your heart rate's increasing. Yeah. All, you are prepared to fight, flight, run away, or freeze yes. up, yes. you know? And so that really makes sense to kind of just be aware of, of that, that flexibility like you're talking about. That's all. And, and as we've oh. said, there, there are times when those reactions are necessary and helpful. Sure. Sure. But we don't, but we don't want to live there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. I know. Yes. And it's so hard sometimes. Like, and sometimes when I'm living there, I don't even know I'm living there. Like I, it's so common for me. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Like I that's am crazy. somewhere else, not in the present. I, like I talk about that sometimes where, you know, it, it, when you're in your, in your mind, you're either in, usually in the past or in the future, you're time traveling, but it's such a lonely place because you can't, you can't. you can't take people with you. You, know? you, can't, you just can't do that, period. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the only place you can meet your kids, your friends, your family is in the present. Like it's, it, it's so, I have to remind myself all the time, like get out of the, get out of your mind and just so that be. <laughs> isn't, yeah, exactly. Just be it. What does that mean? I, I'm still figuring it out. But yeah. that, this is what I, I, my third point was that in dealing with anxiety, we can slow our breathing, slow our heartbeat, and find a balance between body and mind. 
because when I start getting anxious, it's because I'm overthinking things. I'm too, and I've lost awareness of my body. Mm -hmm. So if I can take that moment to breathe and I'll go a step further and say, feel my feet, feel my feet on the floor and breathe, then I'm better balanced in my body, but also between mind and body. Yes, absolutely. That's so, so yes, Molly, it's always so fascinating to talk to you. It really, I always am learning and I feel calmer. <laughs> just, I always have. I feel like just you remind us about all of these things that are, all these tools that are within ourselves that are always there. And just being aware of that, being aware of what we have. Yes. So, so I feel like we should be wrapping it up. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the last I don't know if you hear my toddler in the background. Hopefully I do. not. That's do you? Fine. <laughs> yeah, well, see, fine. I'm riding my my uh, like she's in the background. I'm like, well, I'm just gonna roll it's with fine. this. She's I'm gonna there. roll with this. <laughs> so the last thing I'd like to leave people with is is the word halt. So I let me just say I belong to a club that has a lot of slogans and a lot of acronyms. And one of them that I found very useful is when I'm feeling out of whack in whatever way, I think to myself, HALT, H-A-L-T, am I hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? Mm -hmm. And for me, most of the time I'm hungry because I like forget to eat. Yeah, but, hangry. But some, <laughs> yes, yes. But, uh -huh. some, but sometimes I'm angry and I don't want to. I don't want to go there, so I don't want to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't do any good. I need to acknowledge it and honor it and break a tile or slam my pillow against the bed, but mm -hmm. do something to vent the pop bottle that's been shaken up. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Let go of some of the excess pressure. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm lonely, I can go to my calendar and and look at all the people that reached out to me when my husband passed, and I can call any one of those people for mm -hmm. help or support. Um, and and tired is a good one too. Maybe I need to go lie down for three minutes, mm -hmm. and I feel like I don't have time to do that. But you know what? I do that. I'll set my the alarm on my clock, and I, maybe I just lay on my back, pillow under my head, knees up. And just lay there and breathe for two minutes. And it brings me back to better balance. Yeah. So halt. <laughs> I'm going to have to, I'm trying that tomorrow. Well, tonight, maybe. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I and, love and that acronym. And it's just, you know, it's something I can write on a piece of paper and put in my pocket. And anytime I reach in my pocket for something else, I'm, I'm reminded. Yeah. Okay. I'm doing okay. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Molly. I really appreciate our time together. And I hope you as listeners had learned something. Uh, Molly always um, just amazes me with all of her knowledge and help that she has given me throughout the years. Um, so please um, tune in to the next episode and um, subscribe to my newsletter. Um, check uh, out our YouTube video where you can see the skeletons and the diagrams and the books that Molly had shown as well. And uh, thanks so much, y'all. <laughs>